Okay, everybody, welcome to the final session of the day before we go into our AGM for uh, members and our international supper this evening. So, you might be aware that there's a general election coming. Um, and I've mentioned a couple of times today already that I strongly and truly believe that we need to speak in one cooperative voice about the solutions that the next government can bring to our UK economy. So that's what we're going to be discussing uh, today. So I'm absolutely delighted to introduce now uh, the chair of the cooperative party and the shadow minister for devolution and a brilliant, brilliant politician and a good friend to Jim McMahon. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you, everyone. It's great to be here in uh, Birmingham for uh, a group of fantastic people talking about fantastic ideas, which is essentially what our movement is about. Uh, for those who don't know, I'm Jim McMahon. I chair the Cooperative Party, and I'm also the Shadow Minister looking after local government and English devolution. So my job on the Labour front bench, essentially, is to fill the map of England and make sure that everyone has a devolution offer and a growth deal uh, for their community, and also to make sure that we repair the foundations of local government that has been so badly diminished over the last uh, decade or so. So there's uh, quite a bit to do, uh, but I'm absolutely keen to do it. But in doing so, to make sure that our cooperative values and how we do our own business really is reflected uh, in everything that we do uh, in, in that space as well. Uh, and so, very exciting times, very busy. We were only in Manchester yesterday, uh, Joe. I can see a number of people in the room were there uh, as well for the Labour Party manifesto launch. Uh, and I would say it was a pretty good day for cooperators uh, in that manifesto launch. There was a lot of things that we've been talking about over a very long period of time that we have secured in that manifesto for government. And looking at the polls, although polls don't vote, we know that, uh, but all being well on uh, the 4th of July, we will begin to start realising some of those uh, in a Labour and cooperative government. And whatever your politics, it is undeniable that the last 14 years has seen the country held back, communities held back, uh, but also, I think, increasingly impoverished. You know, when we talk about the ownership question on what assets communities hold, uh, I look at places like mine uh, in Oldham, just outside Manchester, and we see uh, over years and years the things that were the staple of a community, the fabric of a community, the places where people came together, have been slowly uh, eroded. And outside of all the big numbers that you'll hear during uh, an election campaign about the economy, about the cost of living crisis, about the state of public service, one of the things that really stands out to me is that statistic that 75,000 community assets have been lost over the last decade. Now, just think about that, what it means in terms of community infrastructure and community capital, the places where people meet. Add on top of that, the state of our high streets and our town centres, you know, the closure of banks, uh, post offices, pubs, on top of that, you really get a sense of communities that have been hollowed out, really, from the centre um, outwards. So this election is important for cooperators, but it's even more important for the communities uh, that we represent and why does cooperation matter in all that space? Well, I go back and uh, actually one of my kind of pet interests uh, is local history. Uh, so I go back to the uh, kind of 1859 Fails of Industrial Society, which basically was born from a community that was sick and tired of being ripped off uh, by the local retailers, being sold rotten meat at uh, exorbitant costs. And they decided, well, rather than having things done to us, we would self-organise for our community and we would build something together. And that kind of small retail shop built into a farm, built into a laundry, built into a butchery, built into all the things that you would recognise uh, in those early days of a cooperative movement. But it also built the foundations of a community. It built the local library. It provided the first ambulance for the town. It had a first respite care centre uh, built for the town in Blackpool, so people who needed care away from home had somewhere to go near, near, near the beach. And I think we're almost coming full circle now, not just to re-establishing the economy, but also to reconnect people with what it means to be local, rooted, and have the dividend come back to where people uh, live. So very exciting times. Uh, I'm going to hand over now to a video that Johnny Reynolds, he would have been here today, but he's massively uh, in demand, as you could expect, on the campaign trail for the election. I don't know if he's on the, uh, on the red bus that's touring the country, uh, but he certainly will be on a doorstep somewhere. Uh, but he has prepared a short video, and after the video has been played, uh, we're going to hear from Joe Fortune, who I'm delighted is the General Secretary of the Cooperative Party. So let's see the video first. 
My friends, I am so sorry that because of the general election campaign, I can't be with you as was originally planned. But I know in Jim McMahon, you've got a great colleague and friend there who will do a fabulous job. I am incredibly proud to be a member of Parliament that's jointly sponsored by the Labour and Cooperative Parties. And because I live and represent East Manchester, I know the tremendous history and contemporary benefits the corp sector delivers. But what I'm really personally excited about is potentially being the first ever co-op business secretary. And because that means so much to me, hopefully you will have seen in our manifesto that's just been released this week, our plans to double the size of the cooperative sector, something that's been an ambition of so many of us for so long, because we know we can do it and we know the difference that that would make. I see my job as opening up the kind of environment at the top of government that will allow so many of you to grow and succeed and for more people to join what we know is a sector that delivers resilience, prosperity, good jobs, good opportunities in every part of the UK. I hope that excites you as much as it excites me. And I hope you will continue to give us your support, your friendship, and be the partners we need to make that vision a reality. Hi friends, uh, my name's Joe Fortune, I'm uh, incredibly proud to be the General Secretary of the Cooperative Party. Uh, some thank yous first and thanks to Rose and Corps UK for giving this opportunity to talk to you today. It looks like it's been a great congress already. Uh, I'm a bit disappointed I'm missing the international dinner, I'll be honest Rose, that sounds really good. Um, but uh, nonetheless, uh, thank you for having us here and thank you to so many of you in this room who support the Cooperative Party uh, th over uh, every, all the days, months, years uh, it takes uh, to take us to moments in time like we have in front of us as well. It's hugely appreciated. Uh, for those of yourselves who may be newer uh, and haven't really come across the Cooperative Party before, uh, the Cooperative Party is the political party, uh, and I was talking to co colleagues from Lincolnshire about it just now, uh, it, the Cooperative Party is a, the political party of the Cooperative Movement. We have one really clear and important mission to promote and defend the Cooperative Movement in all its guises. That's what we're here to do. That's what we try and do uh, day in, day out. Um, that's the piece which guides us. There's, of course, plans and other bits, but that essential mission is what we're all about. We are a growing political party. We're the fastest growing political party since 2019. Uh, so we are now just shy of 14,000 members, 107,000 supporters, 1,600 uh, elected representatives, 1,600 elected representatives shared with the Labour Party, 1,600 elected representatives. There's one in every four elected representatives in the Labour Party's Labour and Cooperative. So we are a growing party. And I, what I hope from that growth is that we are better able to defend, uh, to, to uh, complete our mission, to complete the mission of uh, promoting and defending the cooperative movement. As Jim says, it's, a, it's been a little bit of a busy period. You'll have to forgive me if I slip into canvas mode. I, I think I've done maybe uh, 10, 15 seats in the last uh, sort of seven or eight days, so I'm not even sure what city I'm in. Um, I, I was definitely in Nottingham recently, and, uh, and now I think Birmingham as well. But look, I want to talk a, a little bit about uh, the manifesto that Jim uh, referenced. And I want to talk about it because of the amount of work which has gone in from many people in this room towards it. I want to talk, talk a little bit about the ambition within what we've been doing in the Cooperative Party. From the Cooperative Party's point of view, we, we wanted to have four clear priorities for the next government to work with our sister party to seek to achieve. And we'll talk a little bit about those uh, today. Um, I wanted to start on growth, cooperative growth. And from the party's point of view, we've been working for many years on the basic of ambition. You have to be ambitious. We know that cooperatives are more productive, more resilient, and create more equal outcomes. We know they do beautiful and unique things in community. So why wouldn't we want more? We want more of them. We want ambition for that growth. Our, our central mission must be to be more ambitious for what we have. We can't be satisfied when there's 7,500 co-ops. We can't be satisfied when our cooperative sector is much smaller than other international comparisons. So I wanted us to be ambitious for growth. I wanted us to have the, the, the opportunity that other business forms are afforded. We, we labour under laws from the 1960s, and we think that that's quite modern. 
we're quite happy to a degree, you know. 90, other companies don't have to do that. Other companies are started and supported to, to, to get going. We're not. I think that we, we want more. We wanted to be ambitious, and that's where we came to with double the size of the cooperative sector. That was a way of us talking about that ambition. It was a way of us incentivizing the new government to want more for us. And I'm so pleased after so many t uh, years of talking about double the size that we do have that in the Labour Party manifesto now. We have a potential government who says, we want to double you. What other types of uh, industry and business would be absolutely cock -hoo? We want to double what you have. It's a remarkable uh, uh, commitment. It's a remarkable ambition. And we, with, with that commitment and ambition comes the responsibility. The responsibility of ourselves in this room We've got to now live up to that as much as anything else. We can't rely on someone else to do for us. That's not us as cooperators. We need to be in that ambitious moment. We need to be the ones who are driving that, uh, that growth. We need to be the ones right at the vanguard, shouting from the very uh, the, the hilltops about what it is to be a cooperative and why we're, we're going to grow and why we're going to double. That's the opportunity ahead of us. I think it's incredibly exciting. And I think in terms of how to grow, what to grow, so we've talked about it being a growth in numbers. We want to have uh, double the number of 7,500 co-ops. That's what we want to see. We want many more people to feel, to touch, to see co-ops on their high streets. We want that opportunity for our movement. We want to ensure that the legislation's there. We want to ensure that the regulation is there. We want to ensure that the development uh, support is there. And we want to ensure that our cooperatives are able to access finance. Four pieces. That's all it comes down to. Now, there's, of course, there's bullet points and, uh, and, and briefing papers that I've been uh, heavily involved in over the, uh, over the last four, uh, four or five years at least. But that's the four bits we want to get sorted. So from the cooperative party point of view, we're going to be working incredibly hard through this next three weeks, of course, but afterwards to achieve that growth. No matter what happens, we're going to be carrying on in that space. There's three other manifesto commitments that I just wanted to touch on. Um, and I think one of them is remarkable and goes really un, un, uh, unsung, uh, which is the Labour Party, uh, working with the Cooperative Party, is offering uh, something called the Local Power Plan. Now, the Local Power Plan is a, it, you know, sounds a bit technical, sounds a bit technocratic, but have a look at what the Local Power Plan really is. The Local Power Plan is GB Energy's number one priority to deliver, right? GB Energy will work with the community, work with the cooperative sector to generate one million owners of community-owned energy production, renewable energy schemes, one million new cooperators in that policy alone. That would be two, two, about 2,000 new uh, community energy schemes in every community across the country. It would generate eight gigawatts of community-owned renewable energy. Eight gigawatts is three power stations. It's a remarkable piece, it's a remarkable policy. I'm so pleased that, to have worked with so many here in, the, uh, in this room, but also within the cooperative movement on that one. Um, the third one is on local ownership. We know, as Jim says, too many community assets uh, pass out from uh, ownership. It, they, they short, they, they leave our high streets. Uh, we know that we need to correct that. And we have the opportunity to bring forward new localism powers. We have the opportunity to, to really make the case to rebuild community power in the country. And I think it's hugely exciting. And lastly, um, people will know, in, many people in this room will know that the Cooperative Party has worked uh, with many here, many societies, uh, to champion uh, 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 new laws against uh, retail crime. Like no movement should walk down the other side of the road when our colleagues are facing horrendous things day in, day out. No movement worth its salt would ignore that. No movement would be satisfied with the numbers, with the, not, not the, number, the experiences, the thousands of experiences that our colleagues in the corps of movement have day in, day out. So we've got the new uh, prote legal protection in that Labour Party manifesto. It will be in that first King's speech. And it's a great opportunity for us in the cooperative movement to do something for our colleagues as well. And yourselves have been such a, an important part of the leadership of that campaign over the time. It's untrue. So they're the, they're the pieces I wanted to touch on. That's what the cooperative party has been working towards. That's what we're seeking to deliver. But we're not satisfied. It's not as if, ah, if we do that, that's it done. 
Job done. We're not in that space. We, are, we, are, we will remain and are incredibly ambitious for our movement, for our, 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 our way of, uh, of uh, business. We are incredibly ambitious for it, so we're not going to finish there. We are going to be looking at other opportunities. We'll be working with that sister party, working with yourselves to try and make sure we have a more cooperative Britain in five years' time. So hugely exciting. Thanks very much for, for listening to me today. All right. Now, I will say at this point that other political parties are available. And if you'd like to go to the Corpus UK website, you can find out what other parties have got in their manifesto pledges with regards to cooperation and mutual growth. I have to say that the very clear intent that you shared with us uh, on, on Thursday, Jim, uh, is very exciting for the movement. Um, we've not got much time with you, so I am going to be going straight to questions. I've got loads of questions, but I book you on a regular basis with my questions. So I'm going to go straight to questions. Who'd like to start? I've thrown you all going straight to questions. Uh, I was going to say, I know Robin's got a question. Robin Feith, Building Society Association. Thanks, Rose. Um, Jim and Joe, look, we were absolutely delighted because, of course, the commitment that's in the manifesto is to doubling the size of the cooperative and mutual economy. And the, the conversation we were having this morning was really scoping the, the huge potential ambition of that, uh, that um, commitment, providing the whole movement is prepared to be really open and wide. And I think one of the th so one of the what I think one of the the question and the challenge is, as we as we were discussing this morning, is how inclusive of the whole mutual world um, is that you know it, would a, would a new Labour government be prepared to be? So when I was reading the manifesto yesterday, GB Energy sounds to me very much like a mutual, a public service mutual, and you know. There was, there's lots of, uh, Rose was talking this morning about Royal Mail, about water. I think there's a huge possibility here, a huge opportunity um, to move the dial very, very significantly beyond uh, just the, you know, if you like, the doubling of the number of, of either, in our case, numbers of members of building societies, in, you know, in, the, in your case, the number of cooperatives. I think we could be a lot more ambitious. I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. Thanks, Robin. Um, I think that there is a remarkable amount of energy within, certainly uh, in the last um, pit short period of time within building societies, within mutuals. It's fantastic to see. It's fantastic to see that yourselves and other wider mutuals feel huge opportunity. Um, I think it's really important that that, that, that uh, remains the case. Uh, it's fantastic, as you say, to see it being cooperative and mutual. Uh, in the manifesto, so I think that's a real positive for all of us. And I think that over the period of time that the cooperative movement in all of its guise is sometimes has spent an awful long time defining itself against one another. Um, and I understand the roots of those discussions and I've had those discussions over many years. Uh, but what I would encourage colleagues uh, is to um, seize opportunity when it comes along. And there is that, so that, that is the moment that we have. Um, in terms of new mutuals within public policy, like what we have to understand is that there is a wider piece of public policy going on other than what is the thing's governance. So whether that be a water company, a train company, uh, like I've looked at in the past, how I came to the Cooperative Party was thinking about how to mutualise train companies. Uh, what we have to ensure is that our, our governance, what it means to be a mutual, actually works within that public policy context. Because it, I, I, for me, I would love to talk about water. I've studied how to mutualise the water industry. I've written a paper on it. It takes 25 years. Like, to, to properly mutualise the water, the water industry will take an investment horizon of 25 years. So for, for me, I think that what we have to be is very strategic very understanding of wider public policy to ensure that we maximise our opportunity, but it is definitely there. 
Thank you. Right, I'm just going to, I'm just going to, just so that Jim uh, gets a couple of questions as well. One of the things that we're talking about in terms of cooperative uh, growth, what we've been talking about today, is how it has to come from the ground up, yeah. and it actually is informed in communities, and communities take ownership of those, and they're not looking to necessarily scale across the UK, but they want to solve their problems in their communities. It sounds like you potentially would be in the perfect position of understanding cooperatives and being in charge of those local governments and devolved powers. So, yeah, what's the plan, Jim? Uh, should you get in? <laughs> well, I mean, I suppose there's two aspects, really. One is, um, I don't, I mean, just like the level playing field, at the moment it's just so easy to go online to companies' house and set up a company with a few pound. Um, there is no route to education. There is no route to, um, to promote the values, the benefits, uh, the advantages, uh, so people can really consider whether a cooperative or mutual uh, versus a you know, a private limited company is, is the way forward. So I, I think one is how do you mainstream some of this uh, is important. And I think that requires us to kind of work out with our, our colleges, our sixth form colleges, our universities, to make sure that we begin to mainstream the language of cooperation. I think we take a bit too much pride, if I'm honest, we're being the best kept secret. <laughs> and I think we need to share a bit more so, so it is mainstreamed. On the other side, though, I do think there is a kind of grassroots uh, movement because that's where most courts really were born from local community need people rallying together people creating some kind of value together people then sharing the dividend of the value that they create uh, and, I, and I think the kind of community ownership thing for me personally in the brief uh, has the biggest opportunity to really safeguard local community assets but also to build new assets so you know as we begin to kind of rebuild uh, new communities as we create communities from nowhere, communities that don't currently exist, we're talking about building 1.5 million new homes, some of those will be new towns, but what about the community infrastructure that supports those new town developments? I think we need to look at every opportunity, which is why I think having just more cooperators in power makes a difference. So, I mean, if you look at the Shadow Cabinet uh, uh, in Labour, if you look at the front bench, we are very well represented when it comes to the, the Labour Party. So you've got a cooperator as the uh, Shadow Business Secretary, you've also got a cooperator as the Shadow uh, uh, leader of the House, actually the leg legislation and the programme for government uh, that will then uh, fo follow that. So I think it's a huge opportunity, but I think always bringing it back round to the community development and making sure in the end the community holds the asset because, you know, elections come and go, governments come and go. We want to make sure that what we create is safeguarded for future generations. Thank you. Right, okay, questions. I'll take uh, a couple at a time. So we'll do uh, Dom and uh, then James, please. Hi, uh, Don Kendall Ward, Group Secretary at Carp Group. Um, something we talk about a lot in the movement is that we in this room all know why we are really committed to cooperation, but we aren't always brilliant at articulating it uh, to others. And, um, you know, if and when we have a Labour and cooperative government, you will, of course, need to be shouting about the benefits of cooperation to make sure that they cut through against other um, manifesto priorities. So um, I'd be really interested to know, what is your one-minute um, elevator pitch on the value that cooperation can bring for the wider economy and society? After, after 20 <laughs> seats uh, in however many, it's a, it's a fantastic challenge, uh, a one-minute elevator pitch on that. For me, I, what I always say is that the cooperative movement provides something unique and, uh, and beautiful. I think that we are a, a way of uh, spreading power and wealth. I think that we do things that no other business form does. Um, that's, the sit, that's the eight words pitch. However, at the start of the question was the, a, a really important piece. Uh, it was about how do we communicate and bring more eyeballs to what we do here and now. And I think that's the, whether that's the TikTok version of the one minute or not, I think that's the critical piece. And for ourselves, um, in our own uh, world, what we've found is we have to campaign on issues which mean something to someone else. What we can't do, and the way in which we can't grow the cooperative party, is by expecting people just to understand and just to get it, and like, if they don't see that as a disbenefit of what we do. So our campaigns have got to be relevant. The way in which we talk about uh, ourselves and uh, in our movement has to mean something to everyone in their daily life. So if you look at what we campaign on, it's what's on your high street, it's what you see in store, it is um, in terms of energy crisis, you know, these are things which people feel day to day, and then we can start bringing them towards 
the, solu the cooperative solution. We can't just lead with that cooperative solution and hope for, uh, hope for huge growth. But that would, so I don't know whether my minute picture is good, but that's, the, <laughs> that's, what, that, that's what we try and do in the party anyway. Uh, I mean, we, we, the, the Labour Party had been really clear, and it was like throughout Keir's speech, I don't know if anyone saw the speech, but it was in the heart of co-op world, uh, if you're a Manky Union, right in the middle <laughs> of the HM at Co-op HQ in Manchester, uh, Angel Square. Uh, and it was growth, 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 all about growing the economy because yeah. we can't afford good public services if we haven't got an economy that's paying taxes into the system. And so how do you create that economy in every part so every community feels it? Cooperation has got to be part of that for all the reasons that we talk about. Yeah. But also, people are really clear they are sick and tired of having things done to them and they are sick and tired of politicians making promises that aren't kept. People want power for themselves and their own communities. And so it's not just about cooperatives in the legal structure that we talk about in a business sense. It's also answering the power question, yeah. and that's social power, it's economic power, and it's political power. Uh, and I, I think that is the thing that runs right through uh, the agenda for Labour and cooperative in government. Mm. Thank you. We've got James and then Vivian. Okay, yeah, James from Cooperatives UK. Um, it seems to me that a lot of the delivery of doubling the size of the cooperative economy would happen through devolved structures like uh, Merrill Combined Authorities, in communities, you know, locally delivered business support, etc. And we could already see around the country, there's lots of places where, you know, bold, progressive leaders are already trialling some incredible things in, in South Yorkshire, in West Midlands, now in, uh, in, in West Yorkshire, etc. Um, how would Labour's approach to devolution ensure that those bold progressive leaders who are already trialling great things can, can do more of those things. I'll do a bit and you do a bit. This, okay, is, a, this yeah. is the sort of thing we talk about at a weekend, you know. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, but it, it, just before Jim talks, obviously, from, from, from his own uh, brief, I think that it's what I was talking about there about development support. I think it's really critical for growth. I think having uh, many more great corps of development ca uh, capacity in the country is absolutely necessary. I think that there will be people here who do remarkable jobs uh, uh, developing new cooperatives, but there's just not enough. So for, for me and from the cooperative party's point of view, that development capacity is critical to, to corp growth. And we would see those sorts of uh, regional structures being well placed for that. Yeah, I mean, what we've got in, so, so my brief really is an, is an England brief. Um, a lot of this is devolved in, uh, to, to other uh, nations. And so when we look at the map of devolution in England, it is very, very pitter. We see it being quite well populated in the Midlands and the north of England, far less so uh, anywhere else. And so for Labour, because we see that deprivation and lack of opportunity impacts every, communities everywhere, not just in the Midlands and the north, we need to make sure that we have a devolution offer that basically puts the right powers in the right places. Now, for some places, there will be a, a tension, a contradiction between the economic footprint and local identity. You know, we talk about these super regions, but people care about the places where they feel connected to. And so we need to tread that carefully. Um, but in the end, we need to be almost like guard against the idea that if we devolve power from Westminster to a combined authority, then the job is done. Because when people went to the, uh, to, to the Brexit uh, referendum and demanded to take back control, they weren't necessarily talking about more politicians, were they? They were talking about people in the agency, in the places, in the communities, in the streets where they live. And that's what's currently being denied. And so I'm pretty determined to make sure that we, of course, have a devolution programme, but we also have it within it a localism strategy as well. If I think about cooperative opportunities where I live, I immediately think about the Bangladeshi women's sewing group that's currently operating out of a primary school classroom that was a short start centre that's now closed, but they're basically self-organising, group buying material, making stuff to sell to the community in a very kind of loose structure. Well, that'd be a fantastic cooperative uh, from the grassroots up. But that's got to have localism built into it as much as devolution. Thank you. Right, I've got Vivian and I've got two minutes, so have we got any final questions? I'm just looking if I've got any... Female yes, questions. Sarah. We'll go to Vivian. Oh, we've got, yes, Sarah. Vivian and then Sarah. Think I'm and then female that's because it. of my name. But, um, <laughs> yeah. but uh, no, building on the, that last response and also on some of the narratives and on Dom, Dom's question and also some of the narratives from this morning's discussion about the increasing individualization of society. Uh, one of the problems we face in building a cooperative economy and doubling the size of it is that not enough people understand what a cooperative is and how they could form one or be part of one. And uh, that problem is not just in this country, it's across Europe and the world. And Matthias Fiedler, who I'm pleased to see is on the next table, president of Eurocoop, uh, 
introduced to the Board of Cooperatives Europe, which I am privileged to serve on, the, uh, uh, a proposal that we should all lobby in our countries, our governments, to, uh, to, to include cooperatives and corporate cooperation in education. Um, because that is laying the foundations for the growth, the future growth of uh, the COP movement. And, and there are so many opportunities, you know, it, it's, it's part of economics, it's part of history, you know, I could go on. Um, do you think this is something that the next Labour and Cooperative Government can do? Could it be incorporated into the national curriculum, into business education? Uh, I really want to hear your thoughts on that. And, and just before you do, I'm going to get Sarah's question as well so you can take them together. Hi, I'm Sarah Longlands from the Centre for Local Economic Strategies. Um, uh, we do a lot of work looking at procurement and social value, and one of the recurring questions we get asked, and I'd be really interested in a, in a future Labour government's view on it, is how do we ensure that you know, generative organisations like cooperatives and mutuals are part of the public supply chain, rather than quite often quite extractive <coughs> providers who take money and uh, and remove it from communities. And it'd be, really, it'd be really good to have much more cooperatives in that space, putting that money back into the communities that, that are being served. Okay, one minute, education and supply chain. <laughs> one minute and get a question from Vivian and Sarah. You know, yes. uh, I'm up against it, definitely. Um, like, on the education piece, I think there is a, an awful uh, lot of need for uh, more people to understand that type of... Uh, operation and, uh, and that avenue for them in, in cooperatives. However, I think that we have to grow and create that demand. I think it will be incredibly hard for a government to simply go on faith that this is required. I think we have to grow, we stimulate the demand, we show that this is something which is of relevance and is working and it will make that, that case stronger. Um, that's not me saying it's not necessary, it's me trying to say how do you get it? How do, you, uh, how do we actually achieve that corpse of edu uh, in education is by showing we're relevant in, um, and in demand. It will start within professional services and then hopefully we can go from there. But I think it would be wrong for me to, to say, oh, we could put it into the national curriculum because I think there's probably a list of, you know, 150 things which need to be in the national curriculum as well. Um, well, uh, from, from my own point of view, I think that that's one way of, of us achieving that education. But I do absolutely accept that it's, ne it's needed. Um, Sarah, the, there is public procurement um, support uh, in, in the offering. You, you will have seen and worked in the procurement bill, uh, the Corps of Party, Labour Party, front bench amendments there to try and ensure that public procurement is better, uh, better open for cultures and mutuals. I think that it's absolutely required um, and something we'll be focused on uh, after, after the next three weeks if things go well. I, I mean, I think on the education part, I've, I've kind of done my bit locally. Our secondary school was converted to a crop academy and my son goes there, so I'm doing my bit. Um, but there's usually opportunities in education. We've, uh, I did a private members bill as a backbench MP for votes of 16. Uh, and that's kind of the headline, giving 16 and 17 year olds the right to vote. But within it was a huge, the lion's share actually of the bill would have been education in schools about uh, political power, social power, economic power. So people have really had an insight into how the country works and how it operates. Uh, and I do think there would be room within there to educate people on cooperatives in terms of community uh, economic power, if, if nothing else. Uh, on the procurement side, I think there is huge opportunity here. If you think about the type of announcements that came through the manifesto, not just with kind of the supply chain stuff that councils generally, the councils, mix, but councils generally have an eye on it in terms of local value return. But think about the, the house building pledge for 1.5 million new homes. There's definitely got to be a cooperative solution within housing uh, as part of that contribution. Think about the pledges for the expansion of early years, you know, cooperative early year providers. Think about the crisis in adult social care and the fact that the private uh, market provision, frankly, is broken. Well, there's opportunity in social care uh, provision, again, for cooperative solutions there. And so, I, I mean, I, I think we're going to see, and this, of course, will contribute to our double the size. I, I think we're going through a, a new area now, uh, genuinely, not just of doubling the size from a numbers point of view, but people being able to see and feel it in their communities, in every aspect of their community. I think it could be quite exciting. Yeah, all very quite exciting. Thanks so much for joining us on your busy, busy schedule. Can I have a thank you for Joe Fortune?